Welcome to the 88th Annual Memorial Day Ceremony sponsored by Eureka American Legion Post 466. Typically, we conduct our program at the site of our Civil War Monument in Oleo Cemetery in Eureka, Illinois for this sacred ceremony. This year is different, so we're, we are presenting this via YouTube, Eureka Live, here at the Eureka High School Auditorium. I'm Dan Herod. I'm a member of Eureka American Legion Post 466, and it is my honor and privilege to be your Master of Ceremonies. The United States of America, land of the free, home of the brave, the greatest country in the world, a nation built and maintained by our military heroes who protect and defend our Constitution and the liberties we enjoy as Americans. Our men and women in uniform exemplify bravery and courage as they pursue the preservation of our liberty and freedom. Our armed forces are comprised of the most selfless men and women in the world. In November, Veterans Day is a day set aside to recognize those who have served or who are serving in the military. Memorial Day, however, is quite different. Memorial Day is the day to remember and pay tribute to those who gave the ultimate sacrifice their lives. While you are rightfully proud of your service member for his or her service, remember there are those who have buried a husband or a wife. There are children growing up without a father or mother. There are heroes who won't get to see their baby take his or her first step or to walk across the stage at high school graduation. They will never experience growing old and they will never meet their grandchildren. These heroes will never get another breath of air or kiss their loved ones goodnight again. They are gone. They exist only in our fondest, most cherished memories. Thus, the name, Memorial Day. Memorial Day is about them, those who died for their country and their families. Originally known as Decoration Day, this day was established to reflect, to honor, and to remember those soldiers who died in the Civil War, almost 500,000 Union and Confederate soldiers died here on our own U.S. soil. In May of 1868, Illinois Union General John A. Logan, the first Commander-in-Chief of the Grand Army of the Republic, mandated the creation of our first Memorial Day. This is the first paragraph of his general order dated May 5, 1868. The 30th of May, 1868, is designed for the purpose of strewing with flowers or otherwise decorating the graves of comrades who died in defense of their country during the late rebellion and whose bodies now lie in almost every city, village, and hamlet churchyard in the land. In this observance, no form of ceremony is prescribed but posts and comrades will, in their own way, arrange such fitting services and testimonials of respect as circumstances may permit. Thirty-nine years ago, President Ronald W. Reagan issued a proclamation for Memorial Day in 1981. He said, over 100 years ago, Memorial Day was established to commemorate those who died in the defense of our national ideals, our ideals of freedom, justice, and equal rights for all have been challenged many times since, and thousands of Americans have given their lives in many parts of the world to secure those same ideals and ensure their children a lasting peace. Their sacrifice demands that we, the living, continue to promote the cause of peace and the ideals for which they so valiantly gave of themselves. And also, having stated this 39 years ago, it is most appropriate for the year 2020, he said. Today, 
The United States stands as a beacon of liberty and democratic strength before the community of nations. We are resolved to stand firm against those who would destroy the freedom we cherish. We are determined to achieve an enduring peace, a peace with liberty and with honor. This determination, this resolve, is the highest tribute we can pay to many who have fallen in the service of our nation. And in 1982, in his second year of the presidency, our very own Ronald Wilson Reagan issued this proclamation on Memorial Day. Since the end of the Civil War, Memorial Day has been the time when we honor the American men and women who gave up their lives on the field of battle. We do this in recognition of the enormous sacrifice they made to preserve our liberty and also our responsibility we bear to transmit liberty to future generations. And finally, Memorial Day is the day when we pay our respect to those who, in the words of Abraham Lincoln, gave the last full measure of devotion. At this time, I would like to invite Senior Pastor Jenny Churchman of the Eureka Christian Church to deliver our invocation. Let us pray. As we bow before you, holy God, we are deeply humbled by the acts of bravery, struggle, and sacrifice we remember here today. While we are met together not on the hallowed ground of our cemetery, our hearts are nonetheless turned toward that sacred place. And indeed, we are mindful of the places throughout the world where lie the brave men and women who gave their lives, including those whose final resting places remain unknown to us. It is fitting and proper that we should do this. Consecrate their memory, that we will never forget what they did, that their witness may long endure. May we remain dedicated to the principles they lived and fought and died for. Equality, liberty, this grand experiment of a nation of the people, by the people, for the people. This we highly resolve. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Churchman. At this time, I'd like to recognize a number of people who have made this Memorial Day service possible. The technical guru who helped put this presentation together, Mr. Tom Hancock, chemistry teacher at Eureka High School. Todd Stalder, we needed his assistance as the director of the award-winning Eureka High School marching band. Eureka High School principal Kirk Edwards, District 140 Superintendent Bob Bardwell, all of our guest speakers today. Each year at the cemetery, over 180 flags are raised by our volunteers. We anticipate those flags are going to be on, will be raised again this Memorial Day pending the weather. And a special thanks to Jan Holliger and Bill Burton for their maintenance and care of our Folio Cemetery where our Civil War Monument stands. At this time, it is my privilege to present our guest speaker. Mike Sager is a World War II veteran who speaks to us today in his World War II uniform. It is my great honor to present Mike Sager. Thank you, Colonel Herod, and good morning to all. In 12 days, we will mark the 75th anniversary of D-Day, the invasion of Normandy on June 6, 1944. As an introduction to my remarks, here is the message General Reich Eisenhower gave to the invading troops, and I quote, you're about to embark upon the great crusade toward which we have striven these many months. 
the eyes of the world are upon you. The hope and prayers of the liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. Your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well-trained, well-equipped, and battle-hardened. He will fight savagely. I have full confidence in your courage, devotion to duty, and skill in battle. We will accept nothing less than full victory. Good luck, and let us all beseech the blessings of Almighty God upon this great and noble undertaking. End of quote. It is an honor to speak to you. My comments will focus on the World War II period and how the American people responded at that time. Because it ended 75 years ago, this will be ancient history for almost all of you. However, it was a critical juncture in our nation's journey. It's the time that tyranny had to be addressed. We Americans are very fortunate because we daily enjoy life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and prosperity. These are precious gifts, but they're so easy to take for granted. We, we know, however, that they are not free, never have been, never will be. Somebody pays. We're here to honor those of all military branches who have paid the price from George Washington at Valley Forge to this very day. We elderly men who, to borrow a phrase from a later war, were soldiers once and young. We, we were soldiers once and young. We served our country during World War II, and like all from the past, we will soon fade away. So what events led the United States to participation in World War II? In the late 1930s, tyranny was on the march. Hitler had overrun most of Europe. Imperial Japan had overrun China. Mussolini had overrun North Africa. Together, these evil forces threatened to impose totalitarianism around the globe. Civilization as we knew it was hanging by a fragile thread. The challenge facing freedom-loving people was that these evil forces had to be stopped. Having been only a short generation since World War I, the American people did not want to be involved in another war. Rather, they hoped to remain at peace. However, that hope was shattered on December 7, 1941, when Imperial Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, destroying a large group of our naval vessels. I remember the day very well. I also remember the, second, the next day, Monday, December 8th. I was a sophomore at Mount Vernon Township High School. Our principal, Mr. Silas Eccles, called an assembly so that we students could hear President Roosevelt. The president described the bombing of Pearl Harbor as a dastardly attack that will live in infamy. And he asked for a declaration of war. The United States was not prepared for war. The people had recently experienced difficult times during 10 years of deep economic depression. But they were faced with a war that had to be fought. Fortunately, the United States had political, scientific, business, military, agricultural, and industrial leaders capable of rallying Americans to the task. Essentially, all production switched from civil needs to war needs. No more new cars, no more new refrigerators, no more much of anything. Rationing began. Meat, sugar, tires, trucks, tractors, and a long list of civilian needs were not were rationed. Bond drives were conducted to raise money to pay for the war. Scrap drives were conducted throughout the nation to recover old iron, old copper, old aluminum so that it could be used to build tanks guns, flames, and so forth. Even the children were asked to save the aluminum wrappers from their chewing gum, and they did so. Big companies made big things. Caterpillar made their famous tractors, which were used all around the globe, but particularly to build airships on the coral islands of the Pacific. 
Ford Motor Company could produce a Mini 24 bomber every 63 minutes. General Motors built tanks, trucks, artillery pieces. Kaiser Shipbuilding on the West Coast could produce a Liberty ship in 80 hours and 33 minutes. Small companies like Royal Typewriter and Singer Sewing Machine made rifles and carbines and other smaller items. Factories operated around the clock. Of course, many men went to war, leaving vacancies in the factory. How, and however, the women, affectionately known as Rosie the Riveter, raised to the task and went on the production line. Rosie put on slacks, tied a bandana around her hair, worked with patriotic enthusiasm to support the war effort. Now about the war. Out of a national population of 135 million, 12% or 16 plus million were in uniform. Early on, we joined the United Kingdom in an air war over Europe. Our objective was to destroy Hitler's war production capacity. The United States bombed by day, the United Kingdom by night. Raids of 150 to 1,000 heavy bombers departed from 84 bases in England. Our B-17s and B-24s were commanded by Americans as young as 19 years of age. In fact, most were in their early 20s. Each plane had a crew of 10. These were extremely dangerous missions because the Germans were very good at shooting down our planes. Normal loss was 5%, often much more. For example, one target was the Ploesti oil refining complex in Romania, which was the source of much of Hitler's uh, petroleum. 175 planes went on that raid. 55 of them were lost. A third of them were jumped. The rest made it back. I had a great school classmate, First Lieutenant Jesse Lee Flanagan, who flew one of those B-25s, and he didn't make it back. Now, what about my service? What did I do? Well, the Army worked pretty fast in those days. 90 days after my 18th birthday, I was a soldier. At the classification point in Chicago, I had an interesting experience. I had thought all about my being drafted, and um, we were going through the process, carrying our papers, and uh, we went up to this desk where there was an officer and as I went up with my papers, he asked me which branch of the service I preferred. I had thought this all out, and I said, the Navy, sir. He didn't look up. He didn't say a word. He picked up a stamp, and in four big red letters on my papers, it spelled A-R-N-Y. So I went then to Camp Robinson, Arkansas, and trained to be a rifleman. And I was very fortunate because I wound up stateside as a classification specialist in general headquarters where officer personnel records were kept. I had the softest and easiest job any soldier could hope for. I met infantry officers from 18-year-old second lieutenants from fresh from Benning, Fort Benning to, to crusty Fulberg colonels, especially including many who had returned from the battle in Europe and Asia. In stark and very contrast to my very easy assignment, tens of thousands of our young men fought and suffered through hundreds of battles from the steaming jungles of Asia to the freezing foxholes of Europe. 16% of the ranks were on the line. It was there that the highest price was paid for our freedom. Frontline battles are very ugly encounters. They involve killing or being killed. There's, they involve killing or being killed. They are dirty, gruesome events characterized by confusion, violence, fear, terror, destruction, and death. They're so dreadful in so many ways, no more will be said of them. 
I will, however, name a few famous battles of World War II. In Europe, Sicily, Anzio, Normandy, Battle of the Bulge, Virgin Forest. In the Pacific, Lehi, Taraba, Iwo Jima, Guadalcanal, and Midway. These battles represent payments for our freedom. Incredibly, the few survivors of these historic engagements are still alive. Our soldiers fought bravely. Tens of thousands died honorably, reaching a total loss of 404,800 deaths in World War II. What is so, what is the meaning to these long ago events? What does it mean for current generations and future generations? Simply this, in order to keep our freedom, we must be eternally vigilant and always prepared because evil never rests. Our nation faces constant threats from within and without. Consider Cuba, Iran, Russia, China, North Korea. We were young when we, we old men were young and we, when we served in World War II. We answered our nation's call, went where we were sent, and did what we were told. In support, the folks at home geared up for war, produced the necessary goods, won the war on two fronts, and in the end accepted nothing less than unconditional surrender. From our foes, Germany and Japan, two countries that are now free and prosperous allies of the United States. All this was accomplished in three years and eight months, and in doing so, with the aid of our allies, saved the world from tyranny. From humble circumstances, the American people rose up in unison and with determination to reach their goal of victory. It's fitting and proper that on this day we remember and respect those in all wars and all military branches who paid the price. The very young who die in service of their country lose their opportunity to enjoy the fullness of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Because of the price they paid, we must never take freedom and liberty for granted because somebody pays. Thank you. God bless you. And may God bless and forever preserve the world's fountain of freedom, the United States of America. Well, I kind of spoke with Colonel. That's good. Thank you. After all, long was nice That's great. Thank you, Mike Sager. At this time, we're going to have a presentation by uh, Eureka Boy Scout Troop 57 under the direction of Scoutmaster Bob McClure. Ladies and gentlemen, today we take time to stand together in recognition and honor of all those who have paid the ultimate sacrifice in service of this nation. Over a million men and women have died in wartime throughout the span of our nation's history. This, of course, does not even begin to take into account the millions who were wounded or went missing. These numbers should truly humble us because they represent people, individuals, who are brothers, husbands, mothers, sisters, friends. These were Americans who were part of communities across the nation. These were Americans who were loved. These were Americans who were mourned. And these were Americans who were missed. Personally, I cannot begin to comprehend the moment when a family sends a loved one off to war. They watch them disappear out of their line of sight, knowing that it may very well be the last time they will see them. This has been a stark reality for many families in this country. So too have been the telegrams, the middle of the night phone calls, and the chaplain standing at the front door of the next of kin to tell them their loved one has been killed. It is all too easy for those who have never suffered such losses to see past the holes that were left in families and communities. As Franklin D. Roosevelt once said, those who have long enjoyed such privileges as we enjoy forget in time that men have died to win. But Memorial Day is a chance to remember, 
and to recognize and to honor the heroic dedication and sacrifices that others have made on our behalf. And in so doing, to reconnect with our nation's rights and freedoms and to our responsibility with an important day in which we ground ourselves in the reality that our way of life has been shaped and made possible by those who have served and by those who were lost. We are able to be here today largely thanks to those who are not. God, make us worthy of their sacrifice. Thank you, Boy Scout Troop 57. That was great. In November 1863, President Abraham Lincoln was invited to deliver remarks which later became known as the Gettysburg Address. This was at the official dedication ceremony for the National Cemetery of Gettysburg in Pennsylvania, on the site of one of the bloodiest and most decisive battles of the Civil War. Though he was not the featured orator that day, Lincoln's 273-word address would be remembered as one of the most important speeches in American history. In it, he invoked the principles of human equality contained in the Declaration of Independence and connected the sacrifices of the Civil War with a desire for, quote, a new birth of freedom, end quote, as well as the all-important preservation of the Union created in 1776 and its ideal of self-government. It is my pleasure to introduce Eureka High School graduating senior Reuben Roberts, who will deliver the Gettysburg Address. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper we should do this. But, in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hollow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it, far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note, nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us living, rather to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather dead, it is rather dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not die in vain. That this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people by the people, for the people, shall not perish on the earth. Thank you, Reuben. We're now going to have, normally we would have a presentation of the National Anthem by the Eureka High School Marching Band, but we're going to have a rendition of that. And following the National Anthem, Senior Pastor Jenny Churchman will deliver our benediction and that will be followed by Taps, which will be performed by Eureka High School senior Adam Waringa.
we depart from one another. May we, the living, go forth from this sacred time more committed than ever to the tasks that remain before us. May we carry with us the noble examples of honor, loyalty, duty, and sacrifice we have remembered here today. Inspire and empower us to remain dedicated to their unfinished work. Indeed, may we work tirelessly for a new birth of freedom throughout the whole earth. Amen. Thank you. That concludes our ceremony. God bless America.